ladies and gentlemen, Director James Mangold. That is a, um, what's that called again, the catch box? Yeah, so we throw this at the audience and they can ask questions and it comes through the speakers. Wow, that's, that's how IMAX of you. Right. <laughs> So before we get started, I want to give a huge thank you to IMAX for being an awesome sponsor. Thank awesome. you, IMAX. Uh, a huge thank you to 20th Century Fox, Carol over there, thank you, uh, for letting us screen the movie before it was in theaters. Uh, so I, seriously, a huge thank you, and, and thanks to all of you guys for coming out on a weeknight to see the movie. Thank you. Um, before we started, uh, by the way, so uh, um, it was a pretty good presentation here, wasn't it? Yeah, just, just making sure. Yeah. Uh, so before we jump into, uh, first of all, thank you so much for doing this Q&A. Thank you. I like doing these things with you, Steve. They're I, always fun. You know, the last time we did one was Logan. That's the last movie I made. Exactly. So. And, <laughs> but I'm, I'm just saying, I, that's still. Was I supposed to do one in between? Nope. But I wanted to just say that it's one of my favorite Q&As that well, I've ever nice. done. Because you were just awesome in terms of breaking down the superhero genre, what you liked, what you had. It was just a great Q&A, and uh, so I just want to thank you for the last one. Thank you. I have a few fun questions before we get into your fantastic movie, because okay. we'll see if they're fun in two minutes. Uh, what TV show would you love to guest direct? Well, Game of Thrones would, would have been the answer until, uh, until it stopped. Okay. <laughs> what movie do you think you've seen the most? Uh, there's a there's a group of them. Um, Sweet Smell of Success. Um, thank you. Um, uh, uh, All the President's Men. Um, uh, it's a Wonderful Life. Um, Jaws. Uh, Alien. Um, uh, a whole series of westerns, uh, floating weeds, a lot of Ozu films. I mean, there's a kind of there's stuff I watch repetitiously, almost as a kind of just reminder. Um, a Black Narcissus, Michael Powell film. Um, I could keep going, but I couldn't think of one. Do you remember what it was when you were growing up that first made you fall in love with movies? And what was it, if you can remember, that maybe flipped the switch in your head that said, "I want to do that." Well, I mean, the the first one, Star Wars, uh, was a religious experience for me when I saw it at um, uh, thirteen or fourteen. When I saw it, I um, it was I was on a trip with my aunt and uncle to see Yellowstone Park, and they lived in Chicago. I lived in New York, and I so I flew to Chicago to meet up with my aunt and uncle. And my uncle took us to see Star Wars at a big theater in Chicago the day before we left to Yellowstone, and then we had two weeks camping out. And the point of saying this is that. I don't remember anything about Yellowstone. Um, I, uh, all, I, all I did was call my parents from Old Faithful and say, "Like you have to see this movie." And the um, uh, that I loved movies before that. I mean, I was I was already making films um, with my dad's Super 8 camera, but that movie, um, and and of course, growing up at that moment, the culture, um, Steven Spielberg, uh, George, all that whole world. Um, of these 28 to 32 year olds making these movies was mind blowing. Um, and the other, the other funny story I have where Alien had a similar effect was a couple years later, but I saw it on opening day in New York alone in a theater. I went to like the 10 a.m. show at the Lowe's 84th, whatever, and the uh, near Zay Bars, yes. And, um, and uh, I was alone in the theater and I didn't know what the movie was and it scared the shit out of me and um and riding home i got the had the joy of telling a story to ridley scott a couple of years ago but riding home um there was some talk radio guy my dad was listening to and he was on abc talk radio and he was saying what a piece of shit the movie was and um 
and that the and he, and he was saying the monster it is even scary man and i was like going nuts in my parents car going what are you talking about and i ran home and this was in the day of rotary dials and i dialed the wabc talk radio number a thousand times from my parents attic and got online uh, on the air and um and the guy who's here's jim from washingtonville who wants to talk about alien what a piece of shit jim and and i was like it was not <laughs> and and he's like yes it was that creature looked like the cookie monster and i was like no it didn't and he was like goodbye jim <laughs> and that was that was <laughs> that was my radio my my early radio appearance that is amazing yeah um, I want to jump, we're about to get into your movie, but what, have you ever watched a TV show all the way through more than once? No. Okay. I mean, except for when I was eight. I've probably seen every season of Gilligan's Island, <laughs> The Brady Bunch, uh, I Dream of Jeannie, and um, I mean, that stuff, yes. But, uh, but no, in recent life, no. I think once, once is enough. What was the last thing that you were really obsessed with? Thing? Yeah, it could be like a book, a movie. It could be uh, a play. I mean, collecting shoes. I go through phases with music. So, so, um, uh, but I, I can't tell you because it would, it would give away what I'm working on. Does it have to do with a large cat? No. There was, a, I think I can't remember the title, but I heard that there was a movie. It's in development, but no, it has nothing to do with that one. Got it. No, now let's jump into why I get to talk to you tonight. Okay. Uh, as I've said repeatedly, I love this movie so much. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to fish for the audience, but did you guys enjoy this? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what was it? Obviously, you, you're an in-demand filmmaker. What was it about this project that said, this is what I'm going to do after Logan? Uh, um. I I've been chasing it since before Logan and since before even the the Wolverine before that. In fact, the meeting I went on at Fox, where they handed me um, uh, Chris McQuarrie's script for the Wolverine, was the meeting in which um, I went in to talk about this movie. And um, the challenge with movies like this, it was it was another team was working on it, and I was not welcome. And the um, but the but the reality is the reason it's so hard to get movies like this made is that it's not um, you know what they call in the business IP it's not pre-existing trademarked stuff where there's a there's a pre-sold audience that's going to show up to see this character or this world in this movie and so when that's the case the studios are very nervous about spending too much money on a movie like that you know, what we used to just call an original movie. And, um, and uh, so what that results in is that when you have a movie like this, there, where there's no real way to do it without spending dough, meaning you can't just, you're creating the races and the cars and the period, it's not gonna be cheap. And so the movie gets stuck um, in a way, luckily for me, it got stuck in that no one would pull the green light on it because they couldn't figure out how to make it um, affordable enough or they want to take the risk on it. And what basically happened is I would check in between every movie about this um, property and this material. And after Logan, um, it was free. And I got together with Jazz Butterworth and John Henry Butterworth, and we kept working on the script. Part of it was to get it to where we could um, afford to make it. And, and also just there were ways I wanted to shape the script. I loved the characters. I loved, um, I'm not a big motorsports guy. Um, uh, in fact, I'm the opposite. Like, I don't think I've ever successfully watched a race from beginning to end, um, except this one. And the, um, and, but that even gave, uh, what I loved and identified with was, was the world of getting these cars on the road seemed a lot like my life, like, like getting movies made. And, um, and I found the characters really inspiring, um, th that they kind of really, Ken Miles is this kind of perfectionist who I really identify with, who is 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 kind of um, isn't really thinking rationally, gets himself in trouble with taxes in any way. He's just in pursuit of uh, he's an artist in a sense, and um, and Shelby is a kind of slightly more 
um, interesting figure in that he's a salesman. He's also an artist, but he's kind of a salesman. And so there's this kind of interesting dialectic going on between these two characters who admire each other, but are both are kind of not exactly in the same philosophical place. And you, 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 when you're looking for a movie, you're essentially always looking, you have to be aware, I am, the movies are simple in a sense. They, they have to work on a, on, a, on a very primal level. They also need a cinematic idea, like making a movie about what I just described isn't good enough, meaning it would be my dinner with Andre, you know, it'd be just two people sitting around talking about their life perspectives, unless you can find a, a way to take these ideas about art versus commerce and, and perfection versus compromise and pursuit of excellence and and how do you, and that the world of a racing film or a sports film gives you um, a framework um, to make something entertaining and engrossing and dynamic um, out of it where even the cars then become, you know, metaphors and interesting um, elements. I mean, all that, and then it's, it's a, it, cars have a beautiful relationship with the movie camera, you know, the, and um, um, so all that was in the mix of why I was attracted to it, and I just kept stalking the movie until I, after Logan, maybe just because of the success of Logan, but it suddenly had become free enough that, that I could jump in. You, so you, get, you sit down to rework the script to get it down to a budget that is something filmable. Uh, how much when you're reworking the script are you thinking about casting, uh, and, or is it sort of like we got to get the script down and that's like the most important thing? You're thinking about all of it, but you don't have a movie without the people. So from the moment I get involved, in fact, I probably most of the effort to get the money down was happening after I had Christian and Matt involved, meaning that the, the, I would have no chance of getting the studio to make this movie unless I had stars in it of some kind. Um, so that there, it just wouldn't happen. Like even if I could get the money down without Christian and Matt, the money would have to go down further. And that because... They're just looking for an angle on how to get your butt into a theater. And without stars and without being able to say it's a Marvel character or a Star Wars character or a Terminator character or any whatever it is, they, they're, they, there's so many of the tokens that they'd normally get to spend to get you out to the theater um, that they don't have, um, that known actors are one of the few remaining they have. And so in a way, the budget was determined by who I had in the movie. And luckily, the first two people I asked jumped in. Uh, Matt, I mean, listen, you, you, those two are two of the best actors working. Uh, how tough, what is it like sitting down? I mean, you've worked with Bale before. Uh, what is it like, do you still get nervous like the night before you're going to sit down with them to talk about the project? Like, man, I really want them to be, like, I need them, I want them. Or is it sort of like, do you know what I mean? Well, you do a little, but it, it works. I mean, it kind of works differently in the sense that it really is all about the script. So you get nervous to get the script right before you send it to them. And then you send it to them, because at least this is the truth for me, they, I, and these, certainly these two guys, they know who I am, and they know my work, and, and in the case of both of them, I've known them both for almost 20 years. So in this particular case, I'm not nervous about screwing up the meeting so much as I have a feeling they're probably gonna know whether they're doing the movie or not before they show up. Meaning if they've read the script and they know me, it's kind of like the, um, but the other way you think about it is once you're doing the meeting and they've read the script, you kind of know you've almost got them. You can only fuck it up. Like it's like, like if they're coming, no, no actor wants to go on a meeting on a movie where they're waiting for the director to talk them into doing it. Meaning it, it's, it can happen, but usually they have to be, they have to see it in some way, they have to feel it, or else they're gonna need you to talk them into it every day, meaning they, they need to get it themselves. So if you don't mind, do you remember what it was like that first time you talked to, to Bale and Damon and maybe some of the questions they had about anything, or was, what was those first conversations like? Uh, Matt was real, uh, really simple, he, very cut and dry questions about um, uh, the script and the uh, very, very, very um, dry, simple questions about how th some things he missed or he thought we could use or whatever, but wasn't, he liked the script a lot. Christian too, liked the script a lot. So I, uh, but the, if you want to kind of know about the process with them, it's, you know, um, it becomes a kind of, 
long-term, year-long or longer ex exchange of ideas. Um, each actor, Matt and Christian, have different ways of communicating. Matt will do it more often, kind of hanging out and talking. Christian, you'll get these wonderful... Um, I think Christian will do that too, but but you'll get these wonderful kind of stream of consciousness emails about what he's been thinking about and researching. Um, uh, and... Um, and each of them have a kind of their own way and and of 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 offering you um their psyche um their instincts i mean if you can recognize it um you know one of the biggest things i've come to feel um uh, you know i teach directing sometimes and one of the biggest things i feel like uh it's hardest for younger directors to embrace is the idea of taking ideas from your collaborators um that 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 and and i don't think as filmmakers we help because when we do our press we try our best to make it look like everything was in our heads before the movie started so that every young filmmaker thinks they need to have everything in their head envisioned like the almost the question like was all like i'll get in situations like this i'll get a question like did you see this all exactly this way in advance and of course the tremendous gravitational pull of your ego is saying yes you know <laughs> but it's a lie of course um that the that that the 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 biggest thing i learned i've learned making movies is that they look better when you take advantage of what's happening as opposed to what you brought only you know, it's like life. You're like everything is better when you're actually listening and watching, and not living inside your head. Um, so that the the this idea of arriving with 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 everything um, preset is is flattering, but and you certainly arrive with an agenda. But it is in that dialogue that you. I mean, I could give you examples of how I discovered this making this movie a long time. Copland, where in the first week I was, I was. Uh, directing the movie and and when I'd ride home from dailies they'd give you this manila envelope with all the stills from the set that the stills guy had taken um, during that week and I was looking at all the stills guys stills on the first week of shooting and they all looked better than any of the frames I was making and what was the difference the difference was I had my storyboards and I had figured it out and this is how it was covered and I knew I was gonna shoot it this way and so then I did it but he just had a camera and he saw Sly standing there and Bob De Niro standing there and he found this great angle here. And it was like he was living in the moment, using the light and the moment and the way the light was falling on the buildings, the way these actors looked on that day and where they ended up with blocking. And I, out of fear of like, I, 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 if I leave my little shot list, I'll lose my map, you know, my AAA map of getting through the day that I wasn't looking. And so it's the big lesson for me in every instance, with collaborators and my crew, with my actors, with everything, is be listening. They have great ideas, and um, and it's easy to say no to them. You just say no, I don't want to do that. But but it's incredible how many uh, directors shut down the dialogue before it even starts, and and don't get the benefit of all these other ideas. One of the things that I commend you for is in all your movies, I think you bring out such great performances from your actors. And you told me recently that uh, you got like a uh, little advice from Robert De Niro on Copland that really changed the way I guess maybe you uh, uh, approach with that. He well, he was um, uh, he had this process when he decided to do a role in Copland. He had this process where he he would just invite. I lived near him, and we had a couple reasons. I think he kind of was curious about me in a friendly or paternal way. Both our dads were painters, fine artists in New York. He lived not far from where I lived in, in lower Manhattan. And, um, but he would ask me over without kind of a, a, what I could perceive as an agenda other than hanging out. And then he would be like, well, why don't we read through, let's read through the script. And, and so then it would just be me and him with Ginger T reading through my whole screenplay with me playing everyone that he wasn't playing. And, um, and first of all, you get this moment of going like, I'm doing scenes with Bob De Niro in his house with Ginger Tea, which is all very cool. But the, but the other part is he just makes you, um, what I realized he was doing was just hanging out and getting used to each other. And that there was a point at which he said to me, um, you know, I don't work with, I haven't worked with a lot of young directors. 
And he goes, the reason why is they're all like in awe of me. And he goes, and I, I need the director to tell me stuff. Like, so I don't want you to be shy. And he goes, so when I'm doing the scene, tell me what you need. And he goes, and I don't mean after you say cut, I mean before you say cut, while it's still rolling. In fact, your voice won't even bother me while I'm acting if you just shout at me what you need. And, and I was like, okay. And, and then we started shooting and I did what he said, which is if I felt like he was off, I go, take that again, come in, whatever. I just, something brief, but I, and he loved it and he'd attack the scene again. And I saw, this was particularly his process, is that Bob kind of gets in a zone and he doesn't want, when you say cut on a movie, you know, all these people descend with their combs and their blowers and their their tape and their measuring and, the, and, and there's all this reset. And if you're an actor and you're kind of in, in, in it, all that can fall out of you, you know, all that can, you can lose the scene while people are making all their stuff perfect. And you can lose whatever that churned up moment, you're kind of feeling it, it's like a wave and you're riding it and then it's gone. So, and Bob taught me that I can be of help in keeping even someone like that, who, um, someone that esteemed, I can be of assistance, and he's looking for me to be of assistance to him, to keep him in the zone, to demand more of him. And that was in the first month I was shooting that movie, and so when Bob De Niro is acting that way and inviting that kind of dialogue with me, then you have Sly Stallone and Ray Liotta and Harvey Keitel and all these other guys on the set who are watching, oh, Bob and this guy, really, they get a good thing going, you know? And the, and suddenly they're all like, yeah, tell me, what, what do you need? And uh, so suddenly he set this tone for everyone, you know, on the movie that was Jim's cool, like, do what he says. And, uh, and, and that movie, I mean, can you imagine entering a movie? Uh, you know, you're like 30 years old, you have Bob De Niro, Harvey Keitel, Ray Liotta, Pete Berg, um, uh, who am I leaving out? Um, the, the entire cast of the future Sopranos. And the... Uh, um, <laughs> And and they were all. It was easy, uh, you know. They were they were lovely, and it was really about Bob teaching you to get mess. To me, what the lesson was. Sorry for rambling. Was about get in the dirt with me. Don't talk to me like I'm a specimen or some kind of strange exotic alien or creature. Don't use a special language. Just act with me. You know, like like get in here and and do this scene with me. How you know and and that combined with other lessons I've gotten along the way has been really useful in terms of uh, I can't tell you how many because I've taught a lot. Um, that how many younger film sets I've seen where the actors are over there and the crews over here. And, and a rehearsal is kind of for a young director, this scary moment, you have to talk to these people and um, they have ideas and, and, and it's all, and yet hanging out with your DP and your tech friends is all fine with your American cinematographer magazines and yeah, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, no stress here, but when I have to deal with them, very stressful and it's like why, why Part of the reason they're over there is because you put them over there. You know, why don't you, why aren't you with them? And I don't know how to explain it. For those of you who do any of these things I'm talking about, maybe you'll recognize what I'm talking about. But it's a really, um, it's a really important thing, I think, to find your friendship with the actors before you even start to ask for anything else. You're kind of your um, uh, a, a language, some kind of vernacular between you that allows you to do what is really an intimate dance, you know, for a long period, for months. Uh, Bale and Damon and all your supporting characters and the ba even the background people in this are tremendous. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, being on set with everyone and maybe how you've changed as a director or is from Copland, did that sort of, I guess I'm, I'm curious, what is what are you like on set now and to, because you managed to shape these great performances. Well, I, I, you'd have to ask someone else what I'm like to get a really good objective answer, but the, the, I think I'm pretty, I, I think I do whatever it takes to get the scene, I'd say. And most of that is about bringing a lot of times just energy, enthusiasm, a kind of sense of, I feel like I'm responsible for the momentum of what can, nothing is worse than a movie set in sludge that kind of enters this kind of 
slogging and um, that it's it's best identified, I think, by the way I see what I do um, besides trying to figure out how the scene's going to be blocked and how it's going to be edited and what shots I need to do that. I'm also trying to make sure that what's en what ends up in those shots is not just a kind of perf perfunctory moment, but something indescribably delicate. Now I can't, or interesting, and I can't always make that happen, but it's, I'm chasing, I sometimes call it like a, a, a feather in the wind. You're chasing, chasing this take where something happens that is indescribable that um you're chasing the perfect lap yes yes and but but it is indescribable meaning to me perfect cinema is when cinema is doing the thing that nothing else can do what is the thing cinema can do that nothing else can do it can read an actor's mind it can get inside their mind you, you could argue that happens on a stage, but no, it doesn't. You're too far away, and it's too presentational. It's not the same. The lens is here, and there's no faking it. And they don't even have to, on stage, you, you, there's no, it, it, it's, and the theater is a different tradition. The cinema is a tradition of, of, of looks and glances first, speech second. The theater is a tradition of speech first. And that the that I'm chasing that thing between the words, that moment, that flicker, that something that is you cannot coach per se. You're just in you're you're in pursuit of this thing, and and so what I bring to the set is a kind of um, uh, whatever energy is required, um, evangelical energy, determined energy, passionate energy. Um, critical energy, whatever is required to try and get it, because the an actor may not uh, may feel I was bossy or difficult or demanding one day, but they will be much more angry if their work is shit. Meaning they'll really resent. The, I've had plenty of actors where I've pushed and they, we've been and we've had crosswords or we've um, pissed each other off. But the thing is that they'll forgive me for in a second if they're good in the scene. If they're not good in the scene and I was really polite. They will never work with me again. So the the reality is that it's all about the work and and in any way because it's what lives forever and gets strung around our necks one way or another. We have to live looking at it and and having made mistakes in movies and you like you can never watch the movie and I go why didn't I why did I you know and now with Twitter I have seventy thousand million people going why did he and you're like you're right why did I I don't know. Uh, I know, I, I know your first cut was a lot longer, but I'm, I want to share it with the audience. Talk a little bit about your first cut versus the finished film. Well, every movie I make, the well, first I think cut had, is. You had a longer director's cut, I think. Of this? Yeah, didn't you? I thought you said. Well, you did. well, it, you, the way you were you use the word director's cut, it would imply I had a cut that was mine and was finished, and Sorry. then someone made me cut it shorter. So no, um, I mean, believe me, they would have loved this to be shorter than that. The um, the. Uh, uh, I haven't had an issue with a cut that way for years, but the, I mean, Copland, yes. I mean, that was a brutal process. And there's been movies where it's more difficult, but that's not the case in the last few years. But the, the when you say director's cut, it's more this way they market Blu-rays with yeah, ex it's, extra it's, shit. It's, it's, and it's my, my, it was my, uh, yeah. uh, not the proper way I should have said it, but I, I guess what I'll say is this. Did you end up having a lot of deleted scenes? Yes, and I'm not releasing them this time. Ah, there we go. Yeah, I've, I've changed my mind. I've kind of realized that it just produces all this, um, what's the movie is the movie. I mean, unless I got, unless, if you see me do it again, it'll probably be a movie where I felt uh, like I had to leave something behind that I really didn't want to. Um, but that the reality is that, that um, this is the best version of the movie we managed to put together, that's for sure. What was the last scene or two that you cut before picture locking? What almost made the movie? Uh, there, there were no big scenes that were cut as much as um, sp there was a, uh, the last thing I really, I, I, I was torn about, but, but was there was a beautiful piece of John Bernthal um, at the uh, Cloverfield Airport where he does, where the Mustang thing is, where um, he has a longer scene with Matt um, when he takes him aside to talk to him inside. 
but I, I didn't think the movie could wait any. We needed to move along. But it was a beautiful piece of work by Bernthal, and um, so it was sad for me to cut. But uh, we have to talk about the racing scenes. Uh, Darren Prescott, I believe, was your second unit. Um, Dar Darren, do it. Some, yes. Yeah, yeah. Darren's done some great work. Uh, I'm curious. Talk a little bit about collaborating with him, and I'll start with that, and then I have a part two. Well, uh, collaborating with him, with with Bob Nagel, who was our stunt coordinator, with, I mean, one of the things I'm really big on um, on my movies is that everyone has their job and their title, but um, but everyone's allowed to get in everyone else's shit. Like, I don't like turf. I hate turf. I hate like that like don't touch my camera that's my deal don't do like i and it exists on a lot of movie sets but i like like if the costume person has something to say about the production design say it it's like i want to hear all this stuff and sometimes the prop guy will solve the whole scene or the look or the or the dressing or i mean that it comes from any which way and um so darren's brilliant um, Bob Nagel is brilliant, but as much they were as much a part of it as all my editor, um, Mike McCusker, um, uh, was was on way before we started shooting, planning um, the the Le Mans and the other races. Um, we were using previs, using Matchbox cars on maps, using um, storyboards. Um, Gabe Hardman um, is this brilliant comic book artist and also one of the great storyboard artists around, and he did brilliant work. Um, at first, starting to lay out keyframes, and, and um, it was a monumental effort on all sides. Um, Darren came in after we kind of had a version of the race um, from beginning to end to help us figure out how we begin to do it. Um, but all sorts of other things come to play. I mean, locations, uh, my AD, Adam Sumner, a genius. I mean, so much planning had to go into figuring out. To give you one example why, the... The track at Le Mans um, doesn't really exist in any form like it did, you know, in in the '60s. So um, it's now kind of graded and beautiful. With f the stands are further from the track. The um, it isn't what it was, which was so romantic and kind of crazy, which was just eight miles of country roads, um, uh, very um, th that ran past a kind of old-fashioned grandstand. And um, so this didn't exist in France anymore, and we had to somehow make it. And not only that, but we needed um, signature places, the Dunlop Bridge, the S's, the, um, the, the, um, the Mulsanne Strait. There were all these kind of signature sections of the, of the track that, that any race fan would recognize and, um, and play a role in how they're fighting through the race and as well as obviously the grandstand the starting and finish line and so we shot th almost all of the track in Georgia most of that shot by Darren um the mul the the like the exterior pieces on the cars going under the Dunlop bridge or through the S's or around the Mulsanne corner or the Mulsanne strait and um uh the White House corner these were all hours and hours apart from each other in Georgia um, uh, why? Well, we had to find places that matched what it really was, but also because um, you have to find places that match that you also can get to and, and they'll allow you to drive cars at, in excess of 150 miles an hour on. So, because you're not looking entirely for racetrack, in many cases you're looking for country road, where you now, like, just think about all the details there you have to work out. You need, like, four or five miles of straightaway country road with poplars down this side. Also, it kind of matches France. And then you need all the people in the area to agree to allow you to drive race cars at 200 miles an hour down their the country roads, and no one has to go at the wrong time to check their mail or they're going to get impaled right so the the um there's a lot of coordination and then all this that now so you have four or five locations in georgia we built in aqua dolce here we built the grandstand at, at an airport in aqua dolce so every time you see any one of the cars do a full revolution around the track you're seeing them leave aqua dolce california as they pass under the dunlop bridge they're in atlanta and then they're as they head to the molson strait they're six hours away in another location in georgia and then as they round the turn again white house corner is yet another location in georgia then as they approach the grandstand they're back in aqua dolce california and on and on and on now that means that 
when it's raining, when it's noonlight, when it's uh, twilight, when it is night, when it's a wet down, wh whatever it is has to be shot to match in all of these locations. The positions of the cars have to match in all of these locations. The relative speed of these cars have to match in all of these locations. The dirt level we had graded on the cars from a one to a five. They, obviously the cars started a zero, completely clean. And then they get up to a five, then it starts to rain and they go down to a two. So the, the, all of this had to be planned, charted, our, our continuity people, our prop people, our, I mean, it's a monumental effort. And um, so, and um, we pre what we could, we planned what we could, we assigned all the numbers and color categories to every shot, um, but it's a, it was really complicated and, and a kind of magic of movies that you feel like these cars are driving around a continuous circle, which they're not, of course. I don't think anyone in this theater realized what went in yeah. to doing that. Are you releasing some sort of like featurette to like explain? To I think people? we have that. Yes, I'm not against all DVD extras, but the <laughs> uh, um, the I, I'm not even against extra scenes. I just didn't do it with this. Um, but the um, but the um, but yes, I think they made several things that detail this and show. Um, the the previs, which was kind of pre-edited, because also as you're working on the movie now, you have kind of we make this previs, which those of you who know or don't know is kind of like a crude cartoon we make of what the race will look like, and then as we're shooting, our editors uh, Mike and Drew start to plug in the shots we've gotten, and then keep the cartoon for the shots we haven't gotten, so you can kind of see this this quilt slowly assembling of the pieces you need and the pieces you haven't gotten, and um, and by the end of the shoot, I was gathering, you know, I could see where we still needed things, and we, we tried to do those in Aqua Dulce, um, of like pick up whatever we had felt like we hadn't gotten when we were in Georgia, and, um, and so did, and Darren was working there as well, shooting whenever I'd be, like at lunch, he'd be suddenly out at the airport or wherever just doing um, loop-de-loops. I wanted to ask, before I open it up to the audience, uh, how did you, talk about the cars and getting the cars there, and uh, was the insurance on this movie a hundred million dollars? No, um, the, um, well, I don't know what the insurance of the movie was, but the, but the cars, I mean, there were days at the Ferrari's shop, um, there were days we had several $30 million cars on the set, but we couldn't, um, between takes, you know, the owner would put a ribbon and cones around it, and the, um, but the, uh, we couldn't drive those. I mean, obviously, we we were wrecking these cars on a on a daily basis and um, um, thrashing them. Also, I mean, they're bumping into each other, into railings, into camera cars, um, and and also just getting thrashed by how hard we were driving them. And the as the cars got thrashed in Le Mans, and um, we had a continuous body shop. We had a continuous, obviously, a garage running continuously, and these cars are being rotated through it. But they're reproductions. I mean, we couldn't. I mean, it's just not possible. It, you could, you can't drive a 1965. Um, you know, you can't do it. You, any one of these cars, they'd be worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and you're not going to race them around the track. So we we built all new. Uh. Yeah, I did you did you get when you do something like this? Do you put it in your rider? I'd like to take one of these home. I thought about it, and then then I got in one, and they're miserable. They're <laughs> they're. I mean, the GT40 is like the most uncomfortable. I mean, it's it's a coffin. It the windshield is in your face here. It's not like we all think of sports cars as these things with 19 point adjustable seats and you know whatever. That's not this. This is like a go kart with a with a sheet metal seat and some crummy vinyl pad on it and the most basic controls and then an engine the size of uh, th that takes up the whole car and drives you I mean you feel like you're in a piece of aluminum foil riding at you know 150 miles an hour and that's why so many drivers died everything was really just about strapping a man to an engine and and encasing him no thought was about crash zones or roll bars roll bars were in fact installed after Ken's death but there were no no one even thought of just putting a simple bar to keep the chassis from crushing the driver until it happened lots of times. It is crazy to think what those athletes and those people did back then. Um, it's, I mean, it's crazy. It's unbelievable. Uh, I'm definitely going to open it up to the audience. So this is the, is this on? Can yeah, you all hear me? Yeah. This is called the catch box. So I'm going to throw it at people. And well, let's see what we got in the audience. Oh, hi, everybody. 
I'll go right over here. Ready? Sorry. With my left Peter hand. Miles, how much input did he give in? Um, uh, a good amount, especially with Christian. Um, uh, uh, he spent a lot of time with Christian before we shot and also talked to Katrina Balf, who played Molly, his mom, and... Um, and then he he's seen the film and has been um, uh, and is very pleased I think uh, uh, very pleased and um, uh, but a lot I mean a lot of the a lot of any characters we could get get anywhere near who were actually there we got to there's another um, uh, Jack McMullen plays Charlie Agapu who is actually a Bentley dealer in Beverly Hills now who was um, uh, Jack is the the kind of little kind of Scottish guy with the th Thick black hair, um, greased back. He was 19 uh, at Le Mans that year, and um, and he they brought him along to France, and he's now a mature man selling Bentleys in in Los Angeles. But he um, remembers all that and was on our set all the time and helped us a great deal. Um, in fact, our wardrobe, in many cases, um, guys like Charlie brought they had kept in their closet all these years what they wore, and they brought it to our. Um, they brought it to our costume department and they manufactured, you know, perfect facsimiles of what it was for our whole pit crew. And, um, uh, and in many, uh, our screenwriters, uh, Jez and John Henry, talked to Carol Shelby before he died. I didn't get a chance to. Um, and, um, but on and on and on. And a lot of our drivers were the sons of well known drivers. Um, and brought their stories. Even Darren and Nagel knew a lot of these people and knew stories. I mean, we had a tremendous amount of wealth of knowledge. The toughest thing you have when you make a real life story, honestly, is there's the age old battle of what's most interesting and what's true and trying to find the balance of that. Um, but there's also the fact that what's true is it, the deeper you dive into anything, I'm sure you've all found this in your areas of expertise, the deeper you dive into anything, the more you realize there are so mul such multiple versions of what is true, meaning that you people don't agree on what happened and they remember it differently and um, uh, not coincidentally, they all remember it in ways that make them the greatest hero of their story. And the um, so... You end up having to play a role as you're constructing a movie like this in which you're trying to thread the needle through what seems to you most likely it happened uh, as opposed to because the stories don't all line up. But also, don't you have to balance the truth with when you're making a two-hour or a little over two-hour movie? Like you're, you're making a movie, but you're also trying to be as honest as you can to what really happened. Yeah, my goal is to is to create like like movies are not really the best format to get your history. So that the the my job at first is I think, but I do think I have a role. We're saying it's a true story, so I can't be present. I can't make shit up, but I also can't. Um, uh, I feel like the thing I can best do is make you feel like you knew these people, you knew this place, you get the tone of the of the world in a way that you know whenever they're in a documentary, they're performing. But what were they like when, the, you know, what is Carol Shelby like? Which Carol has his kind of Cal Worthington -y thing, thing he does when he's on camera. But what happens when Carol isn't on camera? What is it like? And so I'm trying to capture something that you wouldn't get in a, you know, a promotional video or an interview where someone like I am right now is controlling what you see of me. I, I, I want to know what they're like in the kitchen making an egg sandwich. You know, that's what, I'm, that's what the movie's best at, you know, in a way. Sure. Um, can you throw right there? No, oh, what, there's a, oh, I'll go right there in a second. Uh, do you talk into this thing? How about that? That's very good. There. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hi, James. Uh, Tom Stoller, Vintage Motorsport Magazine. Um, very entertaining movie, right off the bat. Thank you. How much did you know about motor racing going into this, and what do you know now? And Second part of the question is, did you go back and look at some of the epic films from the 60s and early 70s like Le Mans? Of course. Steve McQueen, I mean, that's easy to answer. Frankenheimer's it, Grand Prix. Uh, that's my favorite, the last one. Yeah, okay. Frankenheimer's. But the, uh, um, yes, not only that, but there was recently released, I think when we got a lot of it, all these uh, B-roll and extra footage from Le Mans, from McQueen's movie, there was all this other footage that they never got used um, that was really amazing. Um, and for a moment, when we were trying to figure out how to make the movie cheaper, we thought, well, do we use this stuff? And I, I just, I don't think it ever works when you try and combine old stuff and new stuff. It always looks, like, sad to me. Like, um, 
Um, yes, yeah, looks like old stuff and new stuff. And the, um, your other questions were motorsports and what did I know before and after. Very little. I learned almost anything I know about motorsports. I learned making this movie, wow. doing the interviews and doing the um, and and. But I don't think it hurt me in a way. For those of you who aren't into motorsports, like I think that my my angle on the movie or my journey making the movie was one of trying to figure out, not only did I not know much, I did not find it that interesting. Meaning, <laughs> I, 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 um, I mean, I found the cars, the design beautiful, and I love gear. Like, I'm, I, I came up making movies, I love lenses, I love gear, and I can see how people get into cars in terms of getting into the GAC and the gear, and, and I can understand that. But what I didn't get was that whenever I watched races, they seemed really boring to me. And I love sports, but they seemed boring to me because they were essentially like, and the yellow car is out of the blue car, and the blue car is pulling into the pits, and the red car is getting ahead of the yellow car, and the yellow car is falling back. The yellow car is getting back. The yellow car is in the front again. And it's like, why? What? Like, I have no con. And then I hear a bunch of older guys talking about yellow car. He's either having a problem or yellow cars. And it's like, I'm never in, when I watch football, I know the quarterback's hurt his knee and he's trying to play through it. I know when I watch tennis, I know what they're fighting against or the injury they had or why this serve is so hard for them on this side. When I watch motorsports, I'm just watching people guessing at what's going on inside some commercial colored bubble with all these stickers. And first of all, I find that revolting. Just the level of sponsorship has gotten <laughs> fucking so, I mean, look how beautiful it looked when they didn't smother it like STP and smuck and every other fucking thing and uh, and and but on top of that the the we're at the Logan level of the Q&A uh, right the uh, but uh, but the other thing was just that it made me realize what I thought I had to do to make it interesting which is I have to get inside that chassis I have to get inside that helmet I didn't even know why he's downshifting why he's going into the pits I want to get to what they can't do on television, which is which is understanding what the driver and the guys in the pit and their and also the idea in that those days when they didn't have a radio. So there's no you send a guy out in the car, you know, except for holding a, a chalk sign as he passes by, there's no way to communicate to him at all. This gets really fascinating and I feel like it's such an interesting world then to bring the audience into because once they understand the rules of it all. Um, I don't mean the rules like the sporting rules. I also mean like the rules of the world, like the like just like you're making a science fiction movie. This world has its own language and its own its own its own protocols. And that you once once I got into all that, um, which I have to do to do a decent job, which I hope you think I did, then the then then that education is what allows me to kind of um, uh, make the movie. Comment I will make. Um, my father was one of the framers of the sports marketing business, which put all the stickers on the cars. So, <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, you know what? I, I'm not offended. You made a great movie. Thank you, James. All righty. <laughs> Before you throw that real quick, I have to say, I'm actually of the exact same opinion of you when I, uh, I love sports as well. And I, I've always wondered, watching in, in the circles, you brought me in. I actually gave, I, I gave a shit watching these races because I... You know what I mean? You took it behind. Well, you love the characters. Yes. And then you also understand why they're doing... I mean, I, I don't go to nth level of it, but you understand... You, you get a sense of when they're kind of, you know, um, uh, uh, using, they're tailing another car and waiting for their opportunity or waiting for the straightaway or not trying to burn out too fast or not trying to blow their engine or whatever it is, just at least some awareness of what, or when their door won't close, which is true, by the way. His first lap at Le Mans, his door wouldn't close. And I loved the, I, I mean, to me, the irony, it was the kind of thing like only, you could never write that. You'd never have your great hero setting off and in the first lap of their, like, it's like they can't close the door of their car. You realize most people are going to think this is Hollywood bullshit. Like that, the door not closing. Yeah, I give up on those people. Most yeah. people. <laughs> why would that be Hollywood bullshit? It's not making anyone look better. No, but you know what I mean? Like, they're, anyway. But Whatever. Like, Everyone's going to think something's bullshit. Right. I want to, um, can you go right there? Right there? Yes. There I won't even throw it. <laughs> One, I really like the movie and... Um, Thank you. In the last race, race car scene, how much was real and how much was CGI? You mean the whole Le Mans? Um, you mean the yeah. big last race? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the cars are all real. 
Um, the part that's that CG is is, and we built the main grandstand. So you know when they're in the pits and you're seeing the crowd above them. But when you look raking shots, like like. Like if I were shooting uh, Matt here and the crowd above him, this would all be real and real extras. And if I were shooting this way, shooting like raking along, it would be real. It would be real for another 100 or 200 feet, and then it would be a green screen, and then the magic of CG would extend. Um, uh, and when you're looking across the road, the opposite side, we again had kind of a front wall and extras for the first couple rows, but then obviously, well not obviously maybe for you, but I didn't have 20,000 extras every day. So those stands filled with people, the closer people are real people, and then and the distance is being done by CG. Um, sometimes also there's, you know, um, th there's rigging on the cars that the CG would remove. But the cars themselves, we had we shot real cars. I think there's two shots where there features like cars that have been reskinned or something like that to make something match. But the we did all this. No, that was the magic of what Darren and his team did is we really shot cars moving. Wow. Let's throw it right over there. Right. How you doing? Good, how are you? I'm great, man. Uh, fantastic movie. I, I day played on this for a little while, so it's really uh, it was a pleasure. Where were you? Where were you working? I did the fight scene and uh, with, with Matt and, oh, right. uh, and Christian, and then uh, did a couple of the Le Mans scenes that, that we did up in, the, what was it, like Lancaster? Yeah. It was crazy. Uh, hot. And then like the... the yeah, the no one knows that. The first couple weeks, the, the, the whole opening race at Willow Springs, it was 115 degrees yeah. when we were shooting. And I mean, you have, you, you, it's like, I watch it and I'm like, you don't feel it. It's just, <laughs> it's just like, it was so brutal. There, there were like uh, umbrellas flying everywhere. Pop-up tents were just going every which way. It was, it was wild. Wait, so um, what's the question? Question. Um, mutual admiration for Bruce Springsteen. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, I read this article or something, an interview with you saying, you had this fantastic idea of, uh, a film in between Born to Run and Darkness on the Edge of Town. And I, I love it. I've always envisioned something like that. And I am so curious to know if that's still an interest in you. And uh, uh, I yeah. Would, yeah. <laughs> I can tell. And, and also, uh, what is it about Bruce and his music and his poetry that inspires you and keeps you going? Uh, well, it's an interesting question. He, it, 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 he was a huge part of my artistic experience and, the, um, and, and, and teaching me how to write. Um, I think he's a great storyteller. I mean, there's some people um, uh, who tell stories and songs and other people sing about kind of conditions. You know, um, there's, there's, I always think there's two kinds of songs. The songs where someone's telling you like, don't do this or always do that or it's like advice songs and then there's the songs where someone's just telling you a story and um uh springsteen is i mean springsteen's influenced by other great people but the because growing up on the east coast in in the 70s and 80s when he came uh when he when he was coming into being and making all those great albums though those songs um uh are a great lesson in writing and how little you need. I, I, it is uh, what what to me was is the great lesson of Springsteen is how economically you can tell a story, and how for us those of us who are writers how hard we try to avoid sometimes just telling a story. I met a little girl, and I settled down in a little house out on the edge of town. We got married and swore we'd never part, but little by little. We drifted from each other's hearts. Story. What? 21 words. The word little appears four times, but it doesn't matter. It's like, it's not colorful. I don't know the color of the sky. I don't know what the clouds were like. I don't know the color of the house. Who gives a shit? I know it's a story of heartbreak. And I know it's a story where they went in with one idea about where they were going, and life betrayed them. Something betrayed them. And, and it's so few words. And um, so often we get in the way of, of motion. And not only that, but the other thing to go on this digression with you is the other thing I love about Springsteen is we're in an age of irony where meaning it and feeling it is not cool. It's so much easier to make fun of shit than it is to do shit. 
and everyone makes fun, whether it's Twitter or YouTube or just the way people talk, people are just knocking down shit all day long. But what have you fucking made? And uh, and and that to me, Springsteen represents someone who's 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 telling stories about feelings, and feelings are less cool right now. You know, I mean, the fact that this movie is called Old Fashioned is as much a result of how far we've traveled into the age of irony than it is the, of anything else, because it's just it's just like uh, it's just that. I, I think you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, let's go. Hold on. I want Let's go all the way to the back, right over there. Stolen car is amazing, by the way. What's that? Stolen car. Incredible yes. Song. Great movie. Uh, Leo Beebe, was he a real character and was he that much of a dick? <laughs> well, uh, yes, he was a real character. Um, I, I, I mean, Josh, I think, gave him uh, some, there was some special sauce with Josh that I think uh, <laughs> made him extra, uh, extra annoying. But, the, um, but he did do what he did. He did slow Ken down. He did decide um, that a uh, a tie or or the three cars crossing together would be better for Ford than Ken winning by several laps. And um, and he knew how much it meant to him. And he they did at Ford, uh, BB and others have anxiety about Ken as a driver. He was left behind the first time they went. Um, there was there's so. I do, I do think that there were more people that BB ended up representing probably what several more cynical or kind of corporate minded executives were feeling. But I also feel like, you know, the way you tell a narrative, uh, I'm a big believer in writing that there is no bad guy. Like, if there's anything I could tell you as a writer other than write every day um, that's important about writing. Is is that don't use bad guy talk or villain talk. It will screw up your movie. That like everybody's got a reason. Everybody, you know, Leo Beebe was a company man. He actually, if I told, he went to war with with Henry Ford II. They were they they were in the service together. They came back. He was like his younger brother, who wasn't his younger brother. He was very protective of of Henry Ford II. Um, their company was floundering. The whole reason they went to Le Mans and spent all this money was not to win a race, really, but was publicity to sell cars. So in the end, is Leo Beebe a villain, or is he just pursuing why he came there, which is to get publicity for his company? And that's why they did it. And, and is it naive of us to wish for them to be something they weren't? Um, but uh, I do, it is, it, it, it was amazing to me. That was one of the reasons I did the movie was when I got to the point reading the story where I realized also when you guys see this, the poster, I'm sure everyone thinks, oh yeah, the underdogs are going to take a Ferrari and of course they're going to win. And it's like that there's something different about the way the story unspooled. That there's something unique about the relationship of commerce and art or commerce and sport and that, that the reality um, made that more interesting, made the story more interesting to me because it wasn't just, you know, another, it wasn't Rudy with cars, you know. Um, uh, I'm, I think we're basically out of time, Is it do, but I want to, uh, um, do you mind doing like a lightning, you, t you give long answers, but I want to see if we can do like. I'll try and do a lightning round. Yes. Right, so a lightning round w means like we try to go through some questions really fast. So um, do you want to throw right there? So the idea is r fast questions, fast answers. And good throws. Yes, and good throws. <laughs> All right, Henry Ford, that was a great character. What was it like casting that? And I love that Tracy actor? Letts. Uh, he was, I wanted him uh, uh, the first choice for it. I was thrilled that he did it. Um, he's a great actor, great writer, too. Um, and I thought he did an amazing job. Especially in the scene where he's driving. You're not, you're fucking up the lane. I know, right? sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's my fault. You're right. Uh, quick question. Uh, the, some of your movies you write and direct, and some of them it seems like you step in in a process that's already ongoing. How does that change your process? While it, all the, the movies I write, some I get credit. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, wait. Uh, I mean, I don't mean I'm the sole writer. I just mean I never stop tweaking scenes, rewriting scenes, or even screenwriting. But the, 
uh, in the until only about five years ago, the threshold for a director to get writing credit was higher than a writer. So they've changed that. But in my past, there's there's movies that I don't have writing credit on where I would have passed the threshold to get the credit now, but didn't then. Um, but it's but um, I'm. Editing is writing, directing is writing, writing is writing, acting is writing. Again, turf, not a big believer in it. Yes, sir. Perfect, thank you. I want to ask, uh, you recently uh, agreed with uh, McCory about um, new filmmakers. Uh, new filmmakers is basically like a lottery for them. And then he later said like, it's basically almost no lottery at all. And I was just curious, if you were a new filmmaker now, now what would you do to try to achieve success from scratch, Chris's basically. point had nothing to do with a lottery. Chris's okay. point was, well, he meant the lottery like probably. Oh, the chances of. of uh, yes, yes, of yes. winning. Yes. That 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 it's like when you watch some sad soul buying a roll of those stickers mm -hmm. in the uh, those tickets in the gas station, for the f young screenwriters who are asking, how can I get my script in the right place? You're the equivalent to Chris yeah. of the person buying one of the scratching scratch things. That his point is, and it's an entirely in alignment with me, is if you're trying to make it in any craft, apply your craft. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I meet who wrote one screenplay, and then they start going about selling their one screenplay. And it's like, imagine if you were a carpenter, and you were in Vermont, and you made one chair, yeah. and then you left your workplace, and you traveled with your chair to New York to sell your one chair. Yeah. And, and then everyone's like, was well, that all you did? And it's like, yeah, isn't it beautiful? And, and it's like, well, why don't you make more of them? And that, that to me, there's this, and it's fueled by the fact that we read, sorry, this is interesting to talk about. The, uh, <laughs> the, the fact that we read about people getting famous and successful really fast, and we watch all these people get rich doing bullshit on the internet and then being rich really fast, and we get jealous, and we want to have success really soon. But if you love filmmaking, or if you love whatever craft you have, why do you want to be successful really soon with whatever shit you can make now if you know you could be better later? Why do you want to get, th it's only the kind of the, the Kardashian mentality that has us trying to get to someplace before we're even ready to do anything with it. Because I just, I gotta make my score, I gotta get in the door. No, you gotta make your shit good. Like, because the, what Chris is saying is that if your work is undeniably good, mm -hmm. every door will open. You don't have to, you don't have to scratch any tickets. You don't have to worry about, the doors will open. People go, did you see that thing that kid made? Get him in here, as opposed to you knocking at all. And, and that there's way too much calculation about how I can play the system as opposed to how about I just make shit that is so fucking good mm -hmm. that people just go, that's really good, and tell everyone else about it. And that's what Chris was talking about. Can I just yeah. uh, add, add something real quick to that? Just, uh, mainly, uh, he was on the podcast with Brian Copeland recently, yeah. and, and he was saying how he feels like he didn't, he didn't direct uh, Usual Suspects, and uh, basically he feels like he's trapped now, and like ever since he failed with uh, Wave the Gun, that that like, he he's not taken as like a serious director basically, and he, he's he feels like he's never. This like, is you gotta you gotta talk to him about his uh, psychology. Okay. No, no, but basically I, I want I was gonna say like, do you feel like that? He's new, fine, man. Uh, he's I know. Good. I'm just he saying that like, new directors yes, have to like good. direct right away for themselves instead of like just handing it off as as just a writer. Whatever it is, Chris had a, yeah. everyone has a path. I wrote Oliver and Company. Like we all have paths. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. So yeah. Hey, um. Uh, uh, let's just throw it right over here because I think we got to wrap. Okay. Uh, we'll just do one. Whoa. Thank you. Um, I just got to say, this was amazing. This movie, I, my hands are like sweating from watching these race scenes. Good. <laughs> but uh, I, I have, um, I've kind of become an advocate for the stunt community and I recently saw a article where John Bernthal, I don't know if I'm saying his last name That's right. right. Yeah, um, stood up for stunts and he was acknowledging uh, the stunt community and saying that they should be recognized with an Oscar category of their own. Um, I was wondering what your opinion was of that. I think it would be great. I just don't know how you'd, I, I think the trickiest thing is just the way most of the craft Oscars work is that just goes the one with the most that, that attracts the most attention so that it's kind of it's just but I'm totally in support of any way that the stunt um, the stunt community gets honored and in fact toward that in regard to this film 
you know, because always asking, did how much did the actors do? As little as we could have them do as possible, honestly. We want they have families and we want them to go home to them, and they're not trained drivers. They're very good and very skilled. But you you know, if you're not supposed to text and drive, you're certainly not supposed to act and drive, and um, and you're certainly not supposed to act and drive at a hundred plus miles an hour. So um, this is this movie is a magnificent amount of work by an incredibly dedicated. I mean, we had a some of the greatest drivers in the world assembled um, driving these cars. And um, and even when you see Christian behind the wheel, it's not green screen, but it's it's Christian in this vehicle we built called the Buck, the, bu the Biscuit. It, and we also had one called the Buck, but the Biscuit, where a stunt driver um, would be sitting either on top of the car or in the rear driving for him. The controls were, were subsumed to another um, a place on the car, and so he was in uh, a, a car that was you. Could, I could pan almost 300 degrees and not see any gear, and it looks like he's driving, but he's not driving. Command and control of the car is elsewhere, um, as it should be, um, and having a professional focused on nothing. Um, but that's why you can see the other cars right out his window as he is moving at high speed past other stunt drivers, slaloming through because we've choreographed all that. But he's not actually guiding his vehicle that's a guy with a radio talking to everyone else making sure everyone's safe uh just that was awesome um i just also this film just felt like metaphorically it meant so much seeing the um athletes against commerce and uh art uh, artists against commerce in the same way kind of like how the stunt community is fighting against corporate well it's things. hard <laughs> it's hard the whole yeah, entertainment right. industry is tough world I was just going to say that uh, um, I especially enjoyed the pathetic fight scene between Damon and uh, Bale. <laughs> Which was also choreographed, by the way, but choreographed pathetically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, on that note, I really want to commend you for making one of the best films of the year. Thank you, Steve. For, I really mean that. Thank uh, you. A huge, huge thank you to IMAX and 20th Century Fox for being awesome uh, partners and letting us screen the movie early, and especially a thank you to James Mangle for coming out and doing this Q&A. Thank you. Thanks for the great questions, too. Really interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you.